And welcome, Hoosier fans, to another episode of Podcast on the Brink, your weekly dose of Indiana University basketball news and discussion. I'm your host, Jared Morris. Podcast on the Brink is a joint production of the Assembly Call and Inside the Hall. For complete coverage of IU basketball, visit assemblycall.com and insidethehall.com. On this week's edition of Podcast on the Brink, it is just me and Alex, and we are reacting to the big news from over the weekend. Rob Finnessy from McCutcheon High School is the latest four-star commit to Archie Miller and the Indiana Hoosiers, another in-state player. We talk about his recruitment, his game, what he will bring to the Hoosiers, and why Alex is so high on him as a building block for Archie Miller. We also touch on the story that came out regarding Grant Galon, uh, as well as some additional schedule talk from last week that we didn't have a chance to get to. Uh, as always, in the offseason, it's a packed week of IU talk, and all of that is coming for you right now on this episode of Podcast on the Brink. Hey, real quick, a word about this week's sponsor, SeatGeek. Buying tickets to sports and concerts can be complicated, but there is a better, simpler way to buy with SeatGeek. SeatGeek is the smartest, easiest way to get tickets to live events because with SeatGeek's seamless mobile experience, you can buy and sell tickets in just two taps. SeatGeek helps you find the best seats at the best prices, fully guaranteed. There really is nothing quite like seeing your favorite team or musician in person, and SeatGeek will get you closer to the action for a great value. I have SeatGeek on my phone and it's by far the easiest way that I've found to shop for tickets. I can be anywhere, and like I just mentioned, with just a few taps, I can instantly find seats to anything that I want to go to. I actually used SeatGeek to buy tickets earlier this year to see Yogi play here in Dallas. I bought my wife concert tickets for the summer. So SeatGeek is designed to make your ticket buying experience easier than ever. They save you time and money by searching multiple ticket sites to compare prices and find amazing deals. Now, here's how to get an even better deal which is Podcast on the Brink listeners get $20 off of your first SeatGeek purchase. Download the SeatGeek app, enter the promo code BRINK, B-R-I-N-K, today, and you'll get $20 back from SeatGeek. That's promo code BRINK, B-R-I-N-K. And now, on with this week's episode of Podcast on the Brink. All right. Well, it was an eventful weekend for Indiana basketball. And so uh, we convened an episode of Podcast on the Brink here recording on Sunday nights. Just me and Alex. Plenty to talk about just for us uh, this weekend. Alex, how was your weekend? It was good. I'm I'm uh, I'm still in the planning stages for the for how I'm going to view the solar eclipse on Monday. So I figured we would we would hop on the podcast and and talk for about 30 minutes about the solar eclipse and how we'll uh, how we'll all be taking that in tomorrow. So <laughs> sounds like a plan. I uh, you know I, I'm curious. Obviously, the big news from the weekend was Robert Finnessy committing to Indiana, the fourth four star commitment that Archie Miller has gotten, and this is a commitment that he just put out on Twitter. Uh, before we get into the commitment and what it means and how good of a player Finnessy is, I'm just curious from your perspective, when news like that hits, when it's just broken on Twitter, like, do you do you have advanced notice of that? Do you just see it on Twitter like everybody else and then kind of, you know, rush into putting a blog post up? Like, how how does that actually work for you, especially on a weekend when you're not necessarily expecting news to break? Well, depending on the situation, uh I could be given a heads up that something uh, is in the pipeline Uh, and that situation yesterday. I mean, I had a feeling something was coming um, soon. I didn't know exactly when it was going to be, but thankfully I was kind of just hanging around the house. I have certain alerts set up on uh, my Twitter account to get certain people's tweets and uh, obviously was kind of set up with – to get any alert when, when fantasy tweeted, cause I figured that could be uh, what he was going to tweet. So uh, in that situation, kind of a, a preemptive uh, way to stay up on, on what's going to hap- happen and then was able to quickly get him on the phone after he tweeted that, put up a Q and a, and obviously put out some a video that we'd already had ready to, to go uh, when the, the news did break. So it was definitely something I was expecting to, to, to uh, be writing about at some point, uh, but I wasn't exactly sure on the timing. But uh, mo- most 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 of the time, uh, when the uh, 
when this stuff happens, you, you have a pretty good sense for when it's going to happen. And with fantasy, uh, you know, the past couple of weeks, uh, kind of the just from talking to some folks, the kind of the feeling was that he was down to Indiana and Ohio State, and a decision was going to be coming uh, sooner rather than later. So uh, it's one of those deals where this is a you know a twenty four seven three hundred sixty five day a year business, and you have to be ready at any moment's notice. Uh, thankfully, I was at home and. I was able to to get working on it uh, very quickly, and like you said, I mean, you had a chance to to talk with Rob. Did you talk with him, or was or were you going back and forth on text? You actually talked with him, didn't you? Yeah, I talked to him. I called him like immediately. So it sounds like to me that really the determining factor for him was just the relationship with Archie Miller and kind of the picture that Archie painted about you know how obviously there's going to be a need for a point guard. Josh Newkirk is graduating. Uh, you know, there's no obvious heir apparent after that. Now, you know, whether Rob is ready to step in and start from day one, who knows? And maybe we can talk about that. But is that kind of the feeling you got that that relationship with Archie and the plan that he kind of outlined for Rob's role and his development, those were the key factors in him choosing Indiana over Ohio State and perhaps to a lesser extent, Purdue? Yeah. Robert has always liked Indiana. They've... Uh, even going back to the previous staff did a, a good job recruiting him, making him feel comfortable, making him feel at home. Um, he's, you know, it, it's one of those things where when he first got offered by Indiana, you know, I, did, I, I talked to him back then and there was a, a just a sense from, from talking to him that he really, that there was a chance he would end up at Indiana even going back to, to that time. I think he kind of hit the reset button when in, when the coaching change happened just because it was a different um, set of coaches to build a relationship with. But one of the things he pointed out was um, he noticed, he knew uh, that they, that he was one of the first guys that the staff reached out to that made him feel like a priority. And I think he could relate to Archie Miller in a lot of ways because, you know, they played Archie Miller was a point guard in college um, he's recruiting him um, tell, directly, obviously with the help of Bruiser Flint and the rest of the staff. But you know, I think they they built a strong relationship, um, talked a, about a lot of things uh, outside of basketball. Uh, that's one thing that Robert told me several times. I mean, going back to even when we talked to him in Dallas in April, you know, he he mentioned that Archie talked to him about other things outside of basketball. And I, you know, I think that's important uh, just to kind of build a you know, you get to know someone's family, you get to know just kind of like what they, what their likes and their interests are outside of basketball, because, you know, you're going to be around this person for the next uh, potentially four years of your life. And, and you want to see how you relate to them, how, how you communicate. And I think Archie did a really good job of not bombarding Robert in terms of, you know, the communication. You know, he mentioned that they texted two or three times a week, um, I don't think it was to the point where he was, you know, hitting them up every day and saying, oh, um, you know, we need an answer now. I think he made him feel really comfortable, you know, that they wanted him, uh, but they wanted him to make the decision uh, when he was ready and felt comfortable. And uh, they did a really good job in terms of just, you know, the short period of time building a relationship, had him there for team camp and then really made it um, a priority to, to go ahead and uh, get him uh, committed now and, uh, they can kind of move on to kind of trying to finish up the rest of the class. But, you know, I, I do agree that the, the relationship between uh, Robert and Archie was was a, a, a big reason uh, that this happened. I noticed you're calling him Robert. Does he prefer Robert over Rob? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've called him both Robert, Rob. I think, I mean, oh, okay. I did, it's, I, uh, yeah, I didn't know if he had expressed a preference because I typically no, see it as Rob. Okay. No, no, no. I just I always like to be sensitive to that if someone likes no. to be referred to a certain way. So let's talk about uh, Rob Finnessy, the player, because I remember back when you were at the event in Dallas and Rob was there. And I know, I think that was back when he was dealing with some tendonitis issues. And he, uh, you know, I think he kind of got into this rhythm where he would have a really good first game and then kind of struggle the rest of the weekend as he was dealing with some of those injuries. But I remember getting a text from you uh, after one of those games where you were really impressed with him. And I've always gotten the sense in the conversations that you and I have had 
that you've been very impressed with him as a player and very high on him and thought that it would be I mean obviously getting a commitment from an in-state guy a four-star player like you know like Rob would be good but I've just gotten the sense that you were a little bit higher on him maybe than some other people are is that a fair assessment and what is it especially about his game that you like if true yeah I think he going back to when he was a sophomore in high school I can remember watching him in that state championship game. Uh, they played New Omni. They came up short, but his his ability to to kind of lead his team on the court. Um, he was only a sophomore. That was a pretty big stage. I was really impressed with him at that point, and then really got to see him a couple times in the summer that year, and continued to follow him, watch some high school uh, tape of him over this past this season. I think I, there was two or three games where I got a chance to. I watched him film on him and get a chance to see him. I think the things that stand out to me, uh, one, for a point guard, he seems to be um, well-liked, respected by his teammates. I think that's a huge thing with a guy who you're going to have on the court um, kind of being an extension of the coaching staff. I think every time I've watched him play, he seems to – have the respect and be be able to command uh, a team and I think that's important uh, that's one thing that really stands out I think he plays with with a pretty um, good amount of toughness uh, he's not you know he's not a athlete that's going to kind of blow you away when you watch him uh, but he's uh, he's gritty I think in a lot of ways with the way he plays you know he likes he doesn't shy away from contact. He's not going to shy away from a challenge. Uh, he can uh, score the ball in a variety of ways. And, you know, he's a pretty solid shooter. He can get into the into the lane. Uh, he he's more of a, a true point guard, I think, than Yogi Ferrell was uh, in, in the sense that you know Yogi was a guy that could really score and at times looked for his shot more. Where I think as Rob Rob is. He's going to be able to score, but he's also going to involve his teammates, and I, th- I think he's going to make, maybe be more of a, a pass first point guard. And I, you know, I just think the upside of having a guy who can be in your program for years uh, is really uh, how you can build a, a Big Ten championship uh, level team. And I think what they're getting in Rob Finnessy is a guy who's going to be in college probably three or four years and has a chance to, to really just kind of be a, a, a stable presence in the backcourt, someone that's going to uh, make good decisions on the court, someone that's going to be well-liked by his teammates, and someone I think is going to continue to get better uh, because the evidence shows, uh, even from the time that I first saw him play as a sophomore to now, uh, that he is going to steadily improve, and I would expect that to be the case once he gets into college as well. I know this is tough to project, but do you do you think he can be a day one starter as a freshman? I think he might have to be. I mean, I don't yeah. necessarily know how that's going to shake out. I mean, obviously, I think this year Josh Newkirk has the inside track, but I mean, next year we'll see, we'll kind of see. I mean, I think Devonte Green has a potential shot to be. Uh, more of a ball handling presence, but he hasn't, you know, he's even going back to conversations I had with his high school coach. I mean, he, he pretty much told me point blank that he wasn't a point guard. So yeah. um, I, I think Rob has a, a very good chance of coming in and I'm not going to say, you know, he has a, he's going to start from day one, but I think he's going to p- be a, a big contributor uh, right out of the gate. Outside of strength, obviously, which all freshmen need to improve on, and probably you know just improving as a shooter, which again is another one of those things that it seems like all guys need to just continue to work on, continue to get better at. What are the one or two weaknesses in Rob's game? Maybe the things that that keep him right now from being you know a, a five star guy or a top fifty player, and the kinds of things that he'll really need to work on and improve uh, as a college player to you know to be that that star level point guard as a junior and senior. I think he can become more explosive, more athletic. I mean, you are what you are to an extent there, but I think there are certain things that can be done inside of any program with strength and conditioning coach uh, to work on different things. I mean, explosiveness, quick, uh, you know, quick, quicker first step, things like that, I think could be improved. And I think he could get um, more athletic, more explosive. And his shooting, uh, 
can be streaky at times from the perimeter. I think that's one thing he's going to have to kind of hone in a little bit and, and improve. And I think he will, but I, I just think to get a guy in state, that's going to be as solid as, as I project that he will be um, for an extended amount of time. I, th- I think that's how you build continuity, how you build uh, consistency within your program. And I, you know, I, all the guys that Indiana has recruited to this point under Archie Miller, all four uh, are going to bring different things. And I, and I think what really stands out about all of them collectively as a group is I think they're most of them at least are probably three or four year players uh, that, that you're going to have. And I think uh, that's really how uh, ultimately uh, you build a winning team is to have guys stick around and ha- have them develop into juniors and seniors, and then you mix in the occasional maybe one and done or two and out player, and that's uh, really how you um, make deep runs and, and make the tournament every year consistently. Comparisons to past players are always unfair and a bit incomplete, but they can be useful, I think, for you know the majority of IU fans who don't necessarily get the chance to watch a lot of these guys play in high school and just give them a frame of reference for the player and how he might develop. Let me throw a comparison out there for you, and you tell me if this is valid at all. Because as I've, you know, and I haven't watched any full games of Rob, but just watching highlights, hearing what people like you say, reading what other people who have watched him play say about him, the name that comes up to me in terms of a comparison is Michael Lewis. Uh, you know, being, you know, you talked about the, the respect that Rob has from his teammates. That's obviously something Michael Lewis had. Michael was a great scorer out of Jasper High School, uh, you know, coming into Indiana, but obviously, you know, became a great assist man, one of the top assist men, uh, in Indiana history. And also not, an overwhelming athlete, but quick and was able to create space just with savvy uh, and and a really good passer, a guy who really wanted to involve his teammates and obviously, a, you know, a, a solid four year player that is. Do you think that and, you know, now maybe the one difference is Michael Lewis was obviously a very fiery guy, which we remember from some of his uh, interactions with Bob Knight on the sidelines and Rob is much more laid back. So the comparison doesn't hold up there. Uh, but do you think there's any credence there? Is that is that a good comparison for Rob? And if not, do you have any others that might give IU fans a frame of reference for the kind of player Rob is? I mean, I think impact wise, I mean, it could be pretty similar. Um, you know, it's been so long since I remember watching Michael Lewis play uh, when he was a senior in high school for Jasper. And I joke with the, I joke with him from time to time when I see him out on the recruiting trail. I actually saw him in uh, Dallas and joked with him that. Uh, that was one of the most uh, incredible performances. He came to New Albany as like a senior and scored like 42 or 43 points. And he, he let me know immediately they lost the game. So he didn't really care about it uh, too much. But y- yeah, I mean, it's so hard to, like you mentioned, it's so hard to compare players, uh, even, you know, in recent memory. And, and that's just a totally different era, you know, of college basketball. Yeah. I think. You, the the one thing that that really come that, that always has stood out to me about Rob is that he seems to make other guys on his team um, better and, and and comfortable on the court and I think that's one of the most important qualities that you can have as a point guard. Um, his Indiana Elite team wasn't. Uh, you know, stacked with a bunch of talent. They weren't, they didn't, you know, win at, at the highest level in the summer, but, but I saw them put together some, some pretty strong performances and, and he was kind of the key catalyst um, most of the time uh, when they were playing well, when he was kind of banged up and, and not at a hundred percent, they weren't as good. And then uh, when he had his times, when he was playing at a high level, um, they were able to, uh, to play better as a team, so I think one of the one of the like like I said, the one of the biggest compliments you can give somebody uh, as a point guard is is do they make uh, their teammates comfortable on the court and do they make them better? And I think uh, for the most part, uh, he's going to check those boxes. and And I think Indiana fans should be really excited about him. I, you know, he was he was one of the the guys that you know if I had to make a list of the 2018 kids that like on the recruiting board, like who are the guys. If you could pick any of these guys, obviously, you know, some of the five star talent guys are going to be at the top of everybody's wish list. But if you could pick a guy or two who you could get for this class and, and you say, 
you know, three or four years down the line, you're going to say, wow, you know, this was a, a really important kid to get because you know, he's really helped us build a winning culture. And, and I think he would have been near the top of my list. So I, I think that's a, a really good, uh, he's going to be a really good building block. I feel like going forward for Indiana. Let's turn our attention uh, quickly to the other story that broke over the weekend, and that's the story about Grant Galon. Uh, and I say story broke. It's not like anything happened over the weekend, but there was a, a story out of NWITimes.com by Steve Hanlon with the headline, Crown Points Grant Galon Unhappy About Treatment at Indiana University. Uh, and you can read the story to get all the details, but essentially Grant and his family were not too pleased, it seems, with the way that Archie Miller you know, decided to handle... Uh, you know, communicating to him that there, you know, maybe wasn't a future for him at Indiana in terms of a lot of playing time and then what all happened after that. And I just want to get your quick reaction to it. You know, my quick reaction, whenever I read a story like this, it always just it makes me a little bit uncomfortable whenever people leave on bad terms. And I don't, you know, I don't really know why that is. It just always makes me a little bit uncomfortable. But as, as I read through the story and you see Indiana's response and you, you know, you see that, you know, basically Archie Miller, it sounds like, was just very direct with him about his assessment of Grant as a player and how he fit into the system. Uh, to me, it's exactly how you would want a coach to handle the situation. Um, and, and I try to look at that from even a, a parental perspective. Like if, you know, if it was my son playing, is that how I'd want it to be handled? And it is. And I realize that sometimes getting the direct, blunt truth may be you know, can be a little bit uncomfortable and not always that fun to hear in the long run. I think it's always better for everybody involved. And so, you know, to me, and I mean, the reaction of 98% of IU fans that I've seen has kind of been the same, that this really isn't a story. It's, you know, certainly nothing to be upset with Archie Miller about. If you want to, you know, get upset with anything, maybe it's that Grant was not a great fit at Indiana to begin with. Um, but that's kind of, you know, what my quick take on it was. Did you have any any kind of further thoughts on the story with Grant Galen? Well, I think those that followed me on Twitter probably saw some of my uh, tweets earlier to, uh, on Sunday going back and forth with, with a couple of people who for whatever reason, I wanted to try to turn this into some negative thing against IU. And I, you know, like I said, I, I agree with you know everything you said, Jared. There's no way uh, to make this a great situation for everybody. I 100% agree with you that um, if you're going to blame anybody, uh, it, it falls on the fact that he was you know brought in as a scholarship player to begin with because – there was, you know, and, and, and I saw him play, um, I think it was maybe a couple of times in the AAU circuit. And then obviously I watched him last year a little bit in the Indiana All-Star exhibition games and then one of the Indiana All-Star games in Louisville. And that was really the point where I, I kind of looked at this situation and thought, I don't really know if this kid's going to be able to ever be a contributor for Indiana. And so I, you know, I think like, like going back to what I said, I mean, I think if you're gonna, if you want to blame somebody, I don't think Archie Miller is the person you blame. Um, you know, I don't necessarily have, you know, I don't have anything against Grant Galon. You know, he was a, always a, a good kid to deal with. Um, you know, I, I think he was obviously a, in a little bit uh, or a lot over his head, depending on how you want to how you want to phrase it, just in terms of the talent level and when a new coach takes over a program, there's going to be tough conversations that are had and uh, how it was described in the story. It basically sounded like he was, like you said, honest with him and, and kind of told him what, you know, the plan was moving forward. And, you know, if, if, if he wanted to stay at IU, it sounded like he was given the opportunity to do so, even if he wasn't going to be on the basketball team based on the student but, athlete bill of rights he could have stayed and just been a student i, I don't think he's obviously going to be a, a professional at any stage and so it's obviously important that he gets his education uh, to me it, you know the, the main thing problem i had with the story and obviously i don't know who wrote the story or how it came to be but i posted this on the, on the forum that was uh sunday yeah earlier on sunday it was just like how did this story come to be because here we are uh, august 20th uh he he transferred, I think, in, or, or said that he was leaving in early May. And so here we are over uh, at least 
three months after the story ends and the story's coming out now. And it, it just feels like to me, um, you know, a, a hit piece uh, attempt to, to kind of drag Indiana through the mud uh, for reasons I, I don't really understand what they are. We had quotes in there from, from him. We had this high school coach who I've talked to uh, numerous times, a really nice guy. And then his, I think his mom was quoted in the story too. And it was kind of like from the get go, it put Indiana on the defensive. And I, I just don't understand what the motivation was for kind of getting this back out there and having a, a discussion about it. Because I, I don't think like, like you said, I don't think anything that Indiana did on their side of side of it was, was wrong. I mean, it sounded like they were honest with him. They told him kind of what they foresaw, you know, his, future being in the program he asked for his release and now here we are three months later and all of a sudden it's he was mistreated and we want to warn other guys i don't I mean it's obviously not having much of an effect on in-state guys because archie's already picked up two commits from top 100 players in the state so yeah. I, I just don't I, it's it's unfortunate you know i, I definitely would never want to uh, you know have somebody feel like they were mistreated and uh, you know if he if he did you know that's obviously unfortunate but um, I think it was probably best for everyone involved that uh, he made the decision to leave and obviously his feelings might be hurt his family might be hurt by it but but ultimately I, I think everyone it'll blow over everyone will move on and uh, I, I just don't see any wrongdoing in this case by Indiana I mean do you disagree with me or what do you think what kind of no, I, I, you, you had some opening thoughts there but i mean d- d- didn't you think the timing of this all was just kind of weird i mean it, we're 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 three months past this happening so why now it's yeah it's a little strange it didn't it didn't really make sense and i'm i'm certainly not one who is afraid to criticize in these kind of cases like i said my my natural reaction to reading any type of stories like this is immediately to kind of be uncomfortable and kind of side with the player just naturally but you know in this case like you just you you start to dig into the details just the details that are there in the story like nothing else that you know that i know behind the scenes or anything but just the details right there and it just looks like okay i mean that sounds like Archie handled it pretty well. I mean, I don't know what else you would want him to do. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think this is, you know, mostly really a non-story. I don't think it's going to linger at all. I don't think it's going to impact anything. And, look, I think we all wish Grant well, and we hope that he does well in the future. Um, I Yeah, and I just I don't really see what the point of this was. But I don't know. Right. It, it just it, it kind of seemed like... Uh... Like I said, I don't know the author. I don't know how the story came to be. I don't know if the family went to him and said, "Hey, we want you to do a story on this," or if the if the guy has a relationship with the family and was just checking in and this came up somehow. I just it's just like I said, if you write this in like mid May or something, like when this all right after it went down, okay, maybe I understand because it's somewhat topical at that time and maybe you have a better case. But to just kind of like let this happen for three months and then write the story just kind of felt like weird timing to me but but yeah it'll it'll uh it'll blow over quickly and Hoosier Hysteria will be here before we know it and uh everyone will uh, have moved on yeah and and look at the end of the day if I'm Grant I appreciate Archie telling me this because it's really important especially a developmental player like Grant and hopefully he you know has enough kind of awareness of his place and his current talent level, you know, in relation to other big time D1 players to know that he's a developmental player. You've got to be with a coach that has a vision for how you're going to develop. And obviously Tom Crean did. That's why he offered a scholarship. You know, you can obviously debate and we have whether that was a good decision or not. But if you're now with a coach that doesn't have that same vision, doesn't see how you fit in, if I'm a player, tell me that as quickly as possible so that I can, you know, move on and find something else, you know? And so who knows? Maybe Tom Crean is coaching, you know, somewhere next year and, and Grant can go there because clearly Tom Crean saw something in him. Uh, so I just, again, I just think big picture, this was better for everybody the way that it was handled. And, you know, so. right. 100% agree. Anyway, moving on from that, the only other real story I think to talk about right now uh, would be the schedule. That There was obviously a lot of schedule news from this week, and we didn't get a chance to talk about it on our episode of Podcast on the Brink. We did spend some time uh, on our episode of The Assembly Call this week talking about it. Andy and I really dove into the schedule. Uh, and you know, there was a lot of – so many really interesting notes about it just from – the perspective of how much different and odd the schedule is from a Big Ten perspective. Uh, and then 
the the challenges that are facing Indiana. You know, one of only two teams that have four of the one day turnarounds in Big Ten play. There are some teams. I think it's Purdue and Wisconsin that only have one of those. Uh, Indiana has four of them. Uh, and then when you combine that with obviously the gauntlet that faces them uh, from the end of November uh, through those first three weeks in December. This is a challenging schedule, uh, and it's really going to test this team. It's going to test the depth. It's going to test their ability to transition into this new system. Uh, and so I think it will be important for IU fans to have patience. But I have to say, I think it's going to make this season really interesting. Uh, and so, you know, it's one of those for all the challenges, those are also big opportunities for Indiana. And I think the way that the schedule opens up at the end, too. If the Hoosiers can find a way to just, you know, keep their head above water by about, you know, after that first week in February, it really looks like they've got a chance to, you know, to win some games there toward the end of the season and build some momentum. So hopefully they've gotten some in the bank before then. Uh, but what did you, you know, what are kind of the big notes about the schedule that stand out to you? Yeah, I'm just, uh, I, I guess maybe I didn't know what to expect going in or I, I was for for whatever reason I didn't um, think it through enough. I mean, I, I knew it was going to be compacted, with, you know, with uh, the with the games that were going to be moved earlier in December. But I didn't realize how much, I guess, of an effect that the the new TV agreements were going to have on like the scheduling, like in terms of what days of the week the games are being played, because. I don't know about you, Jared, but I, I'm not. I don't, it's not going to be easy for me to get used to having Big Ten games like on Monday nights and Friday nights. It just doesn't seem like t- to me. And, and I talked about this last week uh, w- with Matt uh, Dennison on the uh, Hoosier Report, the, the, the show that I go on every week on Thursday mornings. And we, you know, we the, the one thing I, that kind of stood out to me, you know, everyone talked about like Big Ten playing football games on Friday night and how it was kind of bad because they're taking away from high school bat, high, high school football and for me like the friday night games like especially in indiana like i grew up going to new albany games on friday nights and now indiana's going to be playing college basketball oh, big shit. 10 games on friday nights that. yeah and all of a sudden it's going to be like okay are, are people at new albany all seven thousand that go to the games are they going to go watch romeo langford are they going to watch indiana games and then you'll, you'll have uh, a lot of indiana fans watching the hoosiers on their phone at the new exactly game. <laughs> good, good luck getting your good luck getting your data through yeah. there uh, when you're watching when you're trying to watch a game I, I i just didn't i thought you know accounting for the the two other games in early december i don't understand i i, I don't really get the explanation for why the games are so cramped up and the only thing i can come up with is the tv um, with the addition of fox having all these different nights and indiana being um, as valuable a commodity as they are for TV, I think uh, a lot of the dates for their games are probably really driven, uh, obviously, by TV. And so hey, I think it, that's it, one it reason. Always, it always comes back to blue chips. And the words of the great Pete Bell, it's about money, GD right. money. Always. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's what we're seeing here. So, I mean, the, the, the four uh, one-day break, uh, conference games that's i mean that's just incredible i think the one thing i pointed out and in, in five takeaways is at least on the all four uh the second game is on paper at least a more favorable team than the first game um but but i guess maybe that could work in uh, against you because maybe you are uh taken advantage of by a a lesser opponent that you that you overlook or you know has maybe a little bit more time to prepare uh, that maybe you wouldn't normally lose to and you're going uh, to play them on one day break but you know it's gonna uh, i hope i'm hoping i'm hopeful that it's just a one-year thing i mean i can i guess i can get used to the playing any night of the week although it's weird they have no thursday games in conference play but out of respect for assembly call live on thursday nights there you go so but I'm going to uh, I'm going to sit back and enjoy it. I think it's going to be a uh, I agree with you. It's going to be an entertaining season because there's just not going to once Big Ten starts, there's not going to be any uh, downtime. It's just going to it's going to be rapid fire and 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 I the the early part of the schedule is so intriguing because they have, there's so many games, so many high level uh, opponents that they're going to play before you know they're going to by the time they played Notre Dame, they could have already played like six tournament teams potentially. So yeah. I, I think it's going to, uh, it's going to be a great test. Um, you hope that uh, they're going to be able to get enough wins to where it's not, 
there's not so much pressure on the back part of the schedule where they have to win every game down the stretch to uh, just to make the tournament. But I think it's it's really uh, going to be a uh, interesting, fascinating year. Uh, with that said, I'll look forward to uh, future seasons where we get the Big Ten tournament back in uh, Chicago and Indianapolis, and hope that uh, Commissioner Delaney uh, never <laughs> moves the Big Ten tournament up by a week just to get it in Madison Square Garden again. We'll yeah. leave it at that. Uh, two more notes that I wanted to add. It's important to remember moving the Big Ten tournament did impact the schedule a lot, obviously. There are also some other anomalies this year, like Northwestern having to play in a different arena while their arena is being uh, renovated. Minnesota can't play for a whole week because of the Super Bowl. So there's some really weird things that are one year mm-hmm. things happening this year that also added to it. So it should be very much a return to normalcy next year, uh, at least without those. Now, you know, the impact of TV and if they're going to keep playing the Monday and Friday games, you know, we'll see if that continues. The other thing that I wanted to point out, and I think this is, it can be overlooked because of, you know, the marquee names in the non conference and then how crazy the conference schedule is. But I think it's really important to take note of the two games that are sandwiched right around Thanksgiving. Indiana plays Arkansas State and they play Eastern Michigan. And the reason why I think these games are interesting is because these are the types of teams that Indiana has not been playing in previous seasons that we've all kind of been clamoring. You know, it is nice to play the Louisvilles and, you know, to get matchups in the ACC Big Ten tournament against a team like Duke, you know, where, you know, these are top 10, top 15 teams. I mean, they're, you know, big marquee matchups. But really what hurt Indiana's non-conference scheduling was just having so much just blah at the end of it. You know, so many of the sub-300 teams. And it's not like you have to be playing all these top 50 or top 100 teams. If you can fill out your non-conference schedule with some solid teams that are there in the 100 to 150 range in Ken Palm, you know, the types of teams that are going to compete for titles in their conference, uh, you know, in their conferences, the types of teams that if you come out and don't play can give you a game and shoot, maybe even knock you off if you bring a C effort. Indiana hasn't been playing those teams. And not only do they help you from a strength of schedule perspective, which helps you for the tournament, they actually teach you something about your team as opposed to playing Mississippi Valley State five times. Because again, they're the types of teams that can challenge you a little bit more uh, from a physical standpoint and from a talent standpoint. And so I think the fact that those two teams, uh, you know, both teams that were good last year, I think Arkansas State, you know, graduated a lot of seniors, so it'll be interesting to see how good they are. Eastern Michigan, uh, still a pretty experienced team this year. So I think both of those are solid programs that I'm really glad to see Indiana playing because they're exactly the types of teams that we need to play more in the non-conference schedule to help again, as I said, with the strength of schedule and just playing better teams that can actually give us a challenge. So it'll be more interesting from that perspective, too, because those games will learn a little something instead of just trying to get through, you know, five, six, seven games in the non-conference schedule that tell us absolutely nothing and are glorified scrimmages. Yeah, I also like that they're playing the, th- you know, the three in-state yes. t- teams for the non-conference Indiana State. Obviously, the Notre Dame thing is dictated by the Crossroads Classic and then moving up the Fort Wayne game. Uh, which was originally supposed to take place next season. They're going to go ahead and fulfill the uh, final year of the three-year uh, obligation this coming season. So Possibly uh, opening a spot for the Arizona series, maybe? Uh, I think that the last report I saw stated that would start 2019-2020 season. So I think, I think okay. the original plan was to go to – to Arizona, I think the first year. So I think that would be Archie's third season. Okay. Um, I, I, don't quote me on that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's how I remember the at least the original report on that. But but we'll see. Uh, there's uh, I know next year they play Louisville at home and they play uh, North Carolina at MSG and they also play. It's going to be Butler in the Crossroads Classic, and then you assume uh, they're going to get an ACC Big Ten game and. Uh, wow, um, maybe a Gavit game. So, so next year is going to be uh, loaded again. I, I think we're going to exactly. There's going to be a lot of, a lot of great uh, things. And I think, I think the most important thing to me, uh, which you, with you mentioned, you know, the, playing the better, um, higher ranked teams from the strength of schedule. I mean, I think that there's an art to scheduling, and, and Andy can probably speak to this. But if if you if you schedule the right way, and, and you don't have too many bottom feeders in there and you play in the big 10 and you play, you know, a couple of marquee non-conference games, you're going to have a, an elite strength of schedule. I mean, you, you stay 
kind of away from those sub you know, 300 teams. You, you kind of get some teams there in the mid 150s, maybe sprinkle in a couple 200 plus teams, and, and then you, every every everybody plays one of the bottom feeders. But you don't want to play like four or five of them because it's just going to weigh you down like an anchor. And, and so uh, overall, I think uh, it's going to continue to be perfected over the next couple of years. But I, I think the days of seeing uh, Houston Baptist and Mississippi Valley State and Savannah State and the list goes on in Assembly Hall with you know three or four of those games a year are hopefully over. Hey, I have one more question for you. I know we've yes. gone over the time that we said we were going to go, and I don't even know why we say we're going to try and stick to 25, 30 minutes with these episodes with just the two of us because we always end up going longer than that. Exactly. Uh, but, okay, one last question. I should have asked you this at the end of the fantasy conversation, but where does Indiana go recruiting-wise now you know the class of 2018 obviously if romeo langford wants a scholarship it will be there for him you know does indiana still target a guy like darius garland does indiana now kind of in a position where you know you've got these three four-star guys you've only got a couple of scholarships left you can really cherry pick who you're going to focus on do you try and save a scholarship for the loaded 2019 class like how do you start to see this shaking out now well romeo is going to be the constant obviously they're going to stay in that till the end and I mean, I, I, I say they'll stay there until the end. If they think they have a chance to get them, they're going to stay until the end. And at this point, I think they can be firmly put in the category of they have a chance to get them. So I would expect them to remain uh, in the mix there. And that's, to me, uh, trending towards a spring decision. So you got to keep that open. Beyond that, you know, it, it's really tough to say on the other point guard. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I, I didn't have a great feeling that they were one of the top two for Darius Garland. I'm not sure that this helps them in any way getting fantasy uh, with another with another point guard. So we'll we'll see how that shakes out when he um, schedules visits. But but I don't necessarily think that's a strong possibility at this point. I, I think the really where you look next is is there a forward or big out there that uh, you like enough to take in this class because this this class is just so um, depleted in terms of impact big guys. But do you feel like you need a maybe a four, like a Jake Forrester, or maybe a, is there a five out there somewhere that you feel like can come in and, and give you a lift right away? I think those are kind of the, the doors you knock on next. But, I mean, there's not like a lot of pressure now to – to go out and get a whole lot more in this class. I mean, if, if you could uh, land Romeo, obviously that's the ideal scenario, but I don't think at this point you have to reach. I mean, you got a solid uh, nucleus foundation here. You figure also race Thompson's going to be coming into the mix. So really this is going to end up, uh, you know, he, he's coming on campus now, uh, but he's really going to end up with these guys. So uh, I don't know that you want to add more than, one, maybe two more guys at the most. So I think they can be patient, be selective, uh, kind of swing for the fences and uh, see how it shakes out. But they've really set a strong foundation uh, with this class. Maybe not any five-star McDonald's All-American types to this point, but guys that you're going to be able to build a uh, nucleus with and and, uh, win a lot of Big Ten games with. And uh, down the line with 2019, uh, shaping up to be a, a really uh, strong class and with a lot of a lot of guys there uh, they can they can really kind of be selective at this point going forward i mean this class is actually shaping up a lot like uh you know tom crean's first big class with jordan holes christian watford mo creek elston i mean the, you know there was no superstar in that class and these guys you know maybe their cumulative rating is a little bit higher on average because you know holes wasn't a four star but those were you know solid program building players and obviously creek and watford had you know some elite skills as well uh and both turned into you know excellent college players and that's kind of what this class is you know you know who you know maybe a guy like hunter you know can develop and be a guy who leaves early but you know you you kind of look at these guys and feel like they're going to be around for a while and really lay the foundation for what archie's trying to build 
Uh, and then, I mean, look, that 2019 class is loaded, too, especially with big guys. And Indiana seems right. to be in pretty good position with a lot of them. So that's that's where this becomes interesting because you want to make sure that you have as many scholarships you know, uh, available for guys right. like Keon Brooks and Matthew Hurt and James Wiseman and all those guys. So, like you said, you know, you can be selective because you don't want to promise a scholarship you know, this year necessarily to a guy when, you know, maybe there's a better prospect next year who would be a better fit for the long term. So it's going to be really interesting to see how Archie plays it um, and how he manages yeah. those scholarships. Totally agree. I mean, if you feel like you can get through next season with Deron Davis, Jawan Morgan, and uh, Race Thompson and Clifton Moore is like your primary front court guys, I, I don't necessarily know that you take a, another big or a big in this class unless you feel like it's something that's like a difference maker because you have a chance to get difference makers in 2019. So you don't want to take somebody just to take somebody. Uh, so I yeah. think that's really the approach you have to take. Uh, scholarships are like gold. I think Archie said something like that. So that's right. we'll, uh, we'll see, uh, we'll see how it shakes out. But I, I think, I mean, this is like a good position to be in like for, for any coaching staff. I mean, have, you know, three top 100 guys locked down have a have a chance at a top five top 10 player um, have some other options guys that want to visit and then you can kind of uh, see where it goes from here but uh, solid foundation has been laid and we'll see where it goes from here it hasn't taken archie long to get comfortable in his new neighborhood that is no for sure. not at all not at all alex it's always a pleasure talking about you basketball with you Yep, it's uh, it's a lot of fun, Jared, and uh, we will uh, hopefully be back over these next couple of weeks to maybe start uh, like we did last week with with Brendan Quinn. We'll maybe move around the Big Ten a little bit and uh, talk some, at least some of the the team. I don't I don't think we're gonna have a Rutgers episode, uh, unfortunately, mm. for those of you out there. But but we may move around the Big Ten with with some of the teams that are projected, at least in the top half, and get some perspective from around the league because a lot of times uh you know late august september everybody starts thinking about football and uh, really i just start thinking more about basketball and i want to want to both <laughs> want to go around the league and and kind of see what what people are thinking about their teams so uh, if you have any suggestions for uh, guests that that you'd like to hear on on future episodes you can always uh shoot a tweet to jared or i and uh, we'll uh, do our best to accommodate those requests and uh like you said jared it's uh, always a lot of fun uh talking iu hoops and we'll be back next week absolutely we will talk to you all then thank you for listening to this episode of podcast on the brink we always appreciate you being here to get more from me and from Alex, visit assemblycall.com and insidethehall.com for complete coverage of Indiana University basketball. If you liked this episode, please consider sharing it with a friend or family member who loves IU basketball as much as you do. You can also support the show by leaving a rating and review on iTunes, which helps us get the word out to more IU fans like yourself. We'll be back next week with another brand new episode. Until then, as always, go Hoosiers. Hoosiers.